uh, we are at the optometry uh, conference and we just heard your lecture about how to prevent eye diseases and the role of nutrition. What would be your main message to optometrists? Well, the main message to optometrists would be that we have the ability to uh, prevent and early detection and to uh, intervene as optometrists where maybe the rest of medicine would not intervene by helping people with their eye diseases through nutrition and, and in some cases, if needed, supplementation. So to be able to identify, well, we know with in optometry, an eye exam can detect 300 diseases uh, in an eye exam. So with that being said, why would we not want to maybe try to prevent those 300 diseases in an eye exam? So if we see patients and they're coming in and they're having <clears throat> a routine eye exam and we can have a discussion with them on nutrition and prevention, I think that would be the message that I would like to deliver uh, before they have disease um, that we can detect. It uses skin to measure the amount of carotenoids. And plenty of studies have shown the correlation Mamy wiele badań, które wykazały taką korelację between the macula, skin and serum. Pomiędzy poziomami w plamce, w skórze i w osoczu. Validated many times. To jest wielokrotnie zwalidowane. So we can measure macular pigment with an M-pod. Możemy zmierzyć pigment plamkowy M-podem. If you're low in carotenoids in the macula, you're going to be low in carotenoids in the blood. Jeśli mamy niski poziom karotenoidów w plamce, to ten poziom będzie tak samo niski we krwi. Which would be the skin. I tak samo w skórze. And then they showed it the other way. If you're low in carotenoids in the skin, i wykazano to też w drugą stronę. Jeśli mamy niski poziom karotenoidów w skórze, it's going to be low in the blood. Będzie tak samo niski we krwi. Which would be low in the eye. I tak samo w oku. Now what we don't want to do. I chcemy jednej rzeczy uniknąć. Is just replace with lutein and zeaxanthin. Nie chcemy podawać samej luteiny i zeaxanthin. I'm a believer that we need to do full spectrum antioxidants. Ja wierzę w to, że powinniśmy podawać całe spektrum antyoksydantów. And then if you want to target with lutein and zeaxanthin, I'm okay. Jeżeli ktoś chce zrobić taką celowaną suplementację z luteiną i zeaxanthiną, no to też okay. Uh, you have something uh, being said about dry eye about having some watering drops, about um, Blu-ray, like avoiding screens and having more time outside. But really, you hear something about the food. So what kind of food you would say the optometrist could recommend to the patients to avoid future diseases? Yeah, so you mentioned dry eye, and dry eye has an inflammatory component to it. We hear it all the time. There are drops uh, that are used to maybe combat that, but you know that's a nice allopathic way, but why don't we go and try and help patients uh, in a more of a naturopathic way or maybe integrate both of the both sides? So you know we hear fish oil all the time. Fish oil is you know omega is high in omega threes, a great anti-inflammatory. That's where a lot of the work has been in dry eye, but again, antioxidants are a, are a huge part of that network. So um, another message I'd like to deliver is not only is it fish oil and EPA and DHA, but a comprehensive antioxidant really supports these, uh, as you mentioned, dry eye and these other conditions that are out there um, uh, regarding cataracts. Um, you talked about, you know, blue light um, and Sometimes it scatters and creates, you know, symptoms to the eye. You know, carotenoids and antioxidants are kind of a natural sunscreen, if you want to say. So again, using all these, um, you know, blue filters and taking breaks, nutrition is another part of that missing component. What are you doing in the USA to, to promote your knowledge, to deliver this to the patients, to the consumers? Yeah, well, it, uh, you know, delivering it to the patient is just having that conversation with them. You know, not only am I asking them, you know, what medicines are they taking? I'm asking them, you know, what is their diet like? 
Um, and, you know, a lot of the time it's a processed food type of diet in the United States. Um, and we're trying to get them back, you know, in, 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 we always say in the grocery stores, the way they're lined up in the United States is to stay to the perimeter because that's where the uh, fresh fruits and vegetables are. And then you move into some of the poultry and the cheeses and the cottage cheeses and the good butters, not the bad butters. And when you start going up and down the aisles, I tell the patients that they're starting to get into the processed foods, maybe stay out of the aisles. There's some good things in the aisles, but uh, stay out of the aisles and stay to the perimeter of the store. Um, but, you know, you ask your question of what's, you know, you know, what, what foods, you know, I'm, you know, I'm big on, you know, fruits and vegetables, maybe stay, uh, when it comes to fruits, maybe the lower glycemic or the lower sugar type of fruits, uh, that are out there. Um, but definitely good oils. You know, we always, omega sixes always get thrown under the bus as being bad, but they're really not bad. We just get a lot of them in the American diet. It needs to be balanced out by the threes. So you need threes and sixes. So that's where, you know, the balance needs to come in. So, you know, some good nuts, some good oils, some fruits and vegetables. And then in the fruits, just stay with the lower glycemic or the lower sugar vegetable or lower sugar fruits. Uh, having mentioned this, uh, do you also say to your patients, because you run also your clinic, I understand, and do you also um, warn the patients not to eat just, for example, too much sugar or because this is what makes our vessels very weak? And it also brings problem to the eye, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, high sugar diets, you know, then we move into insulin resistance. And then, as you mentioned, um, you know, when you start getting high sugar intake, the sugar gets converted to an alcohol form of sugar. Uh, dulcetol and, and sorbitol are, are two main components that can damage the capillary. And, you know, and that's why, again, the, the eye has lots of capillaries. We can visualize them through our eye exam or through instrumentation. We have a, 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 an instrument called OCT angiography, which allows us to see these blood vessels. So, of course, someone comes in and they ask how their blood vessels are. Um, and I say, well, they look good. And I say sometimes to the patient, well, maybe you should ask me how you want to keep them that way. And we can have that discussion with them about... Um, you know, keeping, you know, keeping a good diet, staying away from those high sugary, high carbohydrate, ultra processed foods uh, that are out there that will really can well, the body converts quickly to sugars and can damage those blood vessels. So it uh, reminds me of a crystal ball uh, when the wizard is looking into the crystal ball and sees the future. Yes, exactly. Uh, you know, the eyeball, we can call it the crystal ball. So uh, <laughs> the crystal ball of the future. So uh, when you talk to your patients, um, are you as an optometrist allowed to say that uh, the food is the cure for diseases or it can help in treatment of the uh, eye diseases or prevent eye diseases? What is the right, let's say, saying uh, and communication to the patient not to over say what is the role of the food. Yeah, I mean, well, who was it? Hippocrates said, you know, food is thy medicine. And it still kind of stands, uh, I guess, hundreds years later it is being true. Um, you know, what I tell the patients is, you know, when it comes to food and nutrition is that all I'm trying to do is stack the deck in their favor. So, you know, Am I, am I going to say cure? Well, maybe in some cases could be cure, um, but really prevention. Yeah, I, I can say in confidence that if I can change someone's diet, improve their diet, I'm stacking the deck in their favor for more of a preventative, uh, maybe even delaying if they're going to get a disease. Maybe it's a delay of the onset or they don't get the disease as serious as they could. So prevention to curing to somewhere in between uh, if they're going to get a disease. Uh, are there any programs, uh, long time, long term programs uh, for educating uh, patients and consumers in the United States? Can you see such, uh, let's say, visionary changes? There are visionary changes that are occurring. Um, obviously, I've traveled outside the United States and I've seen it for years, you know, in the Asian countries or in the European countries that America was definitely lagging behind. But 
you know, we're getting more concierge type of doctors, more naturopathic type of doc, more nutrition, more focus. So finally, the, 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 the change is occurring. Um, obviously, we want the change to be occurring a little bit quicker. Uh, but luckily and thankfully, we're seeing this change occurring and it will probably reach a point where it becomes exponential um, and then it will probably catch up to the rest of the world. I'm very thankful for this conversation. I hope this will be also a kind of inspiration for our Polish optometrists. Yeah, it's from what I've seen, there's been a lot of uh, uh, enthusiasm, a lot of people embracing nutrition and 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 uh, and diet. So I'm also uh, encouraged to see that it's the, that the message is going to spread not in the United States but here in Poland. I would call it that your arrival here is like a wake-up call. Well, uh, that's, you know, I've had a wake-up call from other people, so all I'm doing is just kind of spreading the message. You know, I guess I'm helping this go viral. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. 92% of what happens to our body is those other pillars that I was talking about. The nutrition, the diet, and the exercise, and the recovery. So that is what we call epigenetics. Lifestyle choices can influence and turn on or turn off gene expression. And we're going to talk about that with macular degeneration. Some patients have high-risk genes. So those are the patients that we want to get them on a, an exercise program. Make sure they're getting plenty of sleep and recovery and, giving, and making sure they have good nutrition. So we have biomarkers, right? Biomarker is any measurement, blood pressure, blood work, heart rate, genetic testing. A lot of us are wearing Fitbits, Apple watches, counting our steps. And then counting your steps and closing your rings motivates you, so that helps, right? That's why we take measurements to help us out. In the functional world of medicine, there are a few predictive biomarkers. Hemoglobin A1C, C-reactive protein, and homocysteine. So we know that hemoglobin A1C, the blood sugar, chronically, to see what it's doing over time, can be predictive. C-reactive protein and homocysteine. Do you have markers of inflammation in your body? Vitamin D. How are those levels in our body? And we know the importance. And a lot of people don't realize vitamin D is actually a hormone. And it's actually a, the only hormone that's not produced by a gland. It's produced by our skin, right? That's why we need to be in the sunlight. And the cholesterol con converts to the liver or the kidney, I forget which one is first and second, but eventually turns into a vitamin D. And why it's a hormone? Because it works at the nuclear level. That's where most hormones work. So vitamin D is a hormone. Omega-3 index, how is our fish intake? And how is that protecting our cell membranes? And carotenoids. So if you go to a functional med medicine doctor, this might be his or her top test. Some have six, some have eight, some have 12. But you can see carotenoids here are very important. Now, let me ask you this question. We're able to measure carotenoids. We can do it in blood tests. We can do it with a skin test. We can actually measure the macular uh, pigments in the back of the eye with a macular pigment optical density test. But we're measuring carotenoids. So carotenoids are one part of the antioxidant system. So let me just ask this question to you and to yourself. If we measured your carotenoid level and it happened to be low, do you think that you're just low in carotenoids and your whole antioxidant system is just perfect? Or do you think if you're low in carotenoids that probably the rest of the antioxidants, that's what carotenoid is, it's an antioxidant, do you think the rest of your carotenoids or your antioxidants are low? Right, so that's what we, the, the answer is through studies and blood work, the carotenoid is the biomarker. If we test someone's carotenoids, what it has shown is everything is low. So we've 
abused in optometry. I haven't seen this in other professions where we've taken carotenoids being low and we replace it with carotenoids. And I'm not saying lutein and zeaxanthin are bad. They're super important for the eye. They're found in the fovea, they're found in the macula, and they have their purpose, but the eye is under oxidative stress and it needs to have a lot more. Here is the annual nutrition. This is a few years back now, but it's the annual review of nutrition. And it's basically saying in this paragraph right here, this line, that carotenoid measurement may become an integral part of the comprehensive ophthalmological care, or might become part of the exam, so that we can integrate and help patients change their lifestyles and nutrition patterns. And you can, and basically it said it didn't really matter how you did it, that we might just want to do it so that we can identify like a, like a pressure, intraocular pressure. Pressure is high, it puts them at risk for glaucoma. If they have a low carotenoid score, it puts them at risk for many eye conditions, the oxidative conditions. Why should we not intervene at a younger level? And it doesn't really matter how you do it. You could do it through the skin test. That's how I do it in my office. You could do it through blood tests, and there's different ways of doing it through an MPOD device. But if you do it, educate the patient that maybe they should be doing something with their nutrition and replacing their whole antioxidant network. So here's what I do in my office is I have the hand scanner. It's very portable and I can measure within 30 seconds. This would be an A plus, A, B, C, D, E. And so I'll do conferences and they'll be exhibiting the hand scanner. I did a workshop here and we were scanning people and people will, will look at this and they'll scan down here in the D and then I'll hear them say, oh, I guess I'll be dead tomorrow. But that's not correct. This is not an acute test. This is just telling us that we have low grade chronic inflammation and you don't want that to go on for five, 10, 15 years. Because if you do, then maybe one of these chronic diseases linked to chronic low-grade inflammation will develop. And that could be dry eye, it could be cataracts, macular degeneration, diabetes, diabetic retinopathy, that was within the eye, moving outside the eye, Alzheimer's, dementia, cardiovascular disease, lung disease, kidney disease, liver disease, autoimmune, cancer. So I used to score right here, 26,000. We, we don't exhale till people get to the green and where you see a significant amount of disease prevention and reduction is when they get to the blue. And that's where I am now. I usually scan somewhere about the high 50s, low 60s. And the reason why I wanna be there is because I know that that drastically reduces a lot of the chronic diseases that can occur from nutrition. So DNA is a study of all of our genes. Genetics is the individual genes. Epigenetics is a study of how our cells control the activity without changing DNA. Anti-aging conference, you can see that always at the top of their list, they want to reduce oxidative stress, which is a marker of inflammation. They're looking at the hormones, glucose, how the gut is working, the immune system, and then they remind everyone that everyone is an individual. Everyone's going to absorb different, everyone's going to sleep different, everyone, everyone's going to respond, treat them as an individual. Personalize, not try to paint everything with a broad brush. But you can see at the top is oxidative stress. And that's one thing that we can do as eye care professionals is intervene and help our patients with oxidative stress. When I was at this conference, I learned a new word, inflammaging. Inflammaging is one of the consequences of failing mitochondria, right? Anti-aging and oxidative stress, they're always gonna focus on the mitochondria. And you can see that 
pro-inflammatory cytokines, TNF-alpha, interleukin-6. We hear about those all the time in dry eye. We hear about those all the time in diabetic retinopathy. And that's because of the failing mitochondria. The mitochondria are very important. I have some fun facts about the mitochondria. They produce the energy for our body. They live about 100 days. 90% of the energy comes from the mitochondria. But here's the sad part. The mitochondria, it's not a clean, perfect system. They produce 90% of the free radicals. Within the uh, brain, there's one to two million mitochondria per neuron. Within the heart, 5,000. Within the photoreceptors, 500 mitochondria per photoreceptor. Within the RPE, there are 700 mitochondria per RPE cell. And when you see a negative macular degeneration, you're going to see that macular degeneration is the disease of the outer retina. And that's why knowing where these mitochondria are and maybe supporting them and helping them can help with the inflammation from, from uh, macular degeneration. So do you agree that free radical formation is a, is a progressive process that leads to cell damage or death? Do you believe that? I think I heard a pretty good amount of yes, right? So what do we use to balance out the free radicals? It's the antioxidant network. And antioxidants, can our body produce them? The answer is no. They're essential. We have to eat them, right? Vitamin A, vitamin B, C, D, all the way through Z your polyphenols, your flavonoids, and your carotenoids. They're all a part of this antioxidant network that help with those free radicals. A free radical is missing an electron. So in this cartoon right here, you see the electron is missing. If you don't have enough, free ra enough antioxidants in your body, it will go and steal it. It likes to be in balance. The body likes to be balanced those electron cells, it will use a healthy cell, DNA, genes, to balance out that electron. We don't want it to use the cells. That's why we were made as humans to eat fruits and vegetables to get our antioxidants. So we've seen this picture before where we have an apple and you cut the apple in half. And as it's exposed to oxygen, it oxidizes and turns brown and eventually will just die. We see the same thing with our cells. And we can see that during an eye exam. The beautiful part of being an eye doctor is we are externists. You have heard of internists as, as, as doctors. We can actually see and visualize most of what we look at. We're lucky that way. We don't have to use x-rays. We don't have to look at blood work or listen to someone's heart and how it's beating. We can see most of what we're looking at, which is lucky. So now we just have to learn to see what we're looking at. And I'm going to show you oxidative stress as we get through. So let me ask you this. Here's some free radicals that can occur in the body. One of them is peroxide. Is peroxide bad for our body? It's not. It's part of our immune system. But do you think an over amount of peroxide is bad for our body? The answer is yes. Right? We don't want to have too much. Peroxide is part of our immune system. Well, during our workshop yesterday, so one of the students in the class very smartly said, should we have a certain amount of free radicals? The answer is yes. But what happens if we get too much, right? It's like going out for a drink. Go out, let's say we're gonna have a glass of wine. That's nice. Then a friend shows up. Let's do some tequila. Another friend shows up. Let's do some fireball. Let's do some more wine, tequila, fireball. Now we're all sick. Too much, right? So we wanna have a little bit, 
but not too much. And with our food sources and our lifestyles and our travel and our work schedule, we can quickly become out of balance, right? UV light, inflammation, smoking, we quickly become out of balance. Our food sources, someone sent me this, where it takes, in the United States, maybe in Europe it's different, but the United States takes 21 oranges of today to make one of 1950. Reason being, when you grow something in the ground, in the backyard of your house, and it's exposed to the elements, and it's growing, the how the plant protects itself is through the carotenoids, the polyphenols, and the flavonoids. When we grow things in greenhouses that are protected, the perfect temperature, they never become tough. And what I mean by tough is they never really get to fully develop into all the antioxidants that the plant needs if it was out in the weather, out in your backyard. Better than what you're buying at the grocery store. Okay, so nutrition, our food is not the same. When you have this, the equalizer is supposed to be our fruits and vegetables, the rainbow. But sometimes our rainbow is not as bright as it should be. Here, this is walking through a Marriott at one of the lectures I was on my way to. And I said, look at this typical American. Ate all the eggs, ate all the bacon, the potatoes. Well, maybe left one potato. Left the good stuff. <laughs> Smothered it with ketchup, which has high sugar, right? High fructose corn syrup. So I ate those, touched through those uh, cantaloupe and pineapple. Just kidding, I did not. <laughs> but this is what we see. This is why in America we have so much disease, right? So nutrition antioxidants. Within eye care, we've been beaten to death about lutein and zeaxanthin, right? Lutein, zeaxanthin, let's make sure. I do not hate lutein and zeaxanthin. There's been great work done in that arena, but we limit ourselves when we have the whole alphabet of antioxidants. We have an eye that's under oxidative stress, and we just want to give it lutein and zeaxanthin or if someone has advanced macular degeneration, we give them the AREDS formula, right? What about someone in their 50s that has a parent with macular degeneration? Shouldn't we want to intervene and try and help that patient out? And the answer is yes, right? We want to help that patient out. So nutritional antioxidants, they neutralize the free radicals. They repair the oxidized membranes. <laughs> They decrease the oxygen species, those free radicals, and again, neutralize them. Here is the one picture or one representation of the antioxidant network. There are a few antioxidants that our body can make, and endogenous, non-enzymatic and enzymatic, and they're listed here. But you can see over here the exogenous, which means your body has to take them in, are things like vitamin A, C, E, K, beta carotene, your polyphenols, your flavonoids, things like quercetin, resveratrol, curcumin, and carotenoids. That means you have to eat them. And then how are our diets? Are we eating the full rainbow, right? I have cleaned up my diet after moving into this arena and want my score to be high. I have to also do it through supplementation. Nutritionists will say you shouldn't have to do it through, through supplementation. We're not all nutritionists, some nutritionists, and I agree. But with my travel schedule, with the food sources that we have, I choose to help myself out through supplementation because when the, when the vitamin D or the vitamin C gets to the cell, it doesn't say, hey, you came from a supplement rather than an orange, right? The cell just needs the vitamin C. 
but there are different ways out there and different companies out there and there's different qualities which then creates the confusion. So carotenoids, they're organic pigments. They're produced by plants, algae, and bacteria. 700 have been found in nature, 50 in our food sources, and in our blood, 15 to 20. And we talk about two of them all the time, lutein and zeaxanthin. They're important. Here is one conclusion that I came up with. The fovea is curved, right? To me, it's the third lens of the eye. The cornea is curved, the lens is curved, front and back, and the fovea is curved. And we put lutein and zeaxanthin in as a pigment, as a no glare for our glasses, to create better vision. It absorbs the blue light, so it helps protect the cones down below. It helps with the scattering of light, and it helps with contrast sensitivity and glare disability. That's really the importance, and it does have some protection. We have to give the eye more protection. So again, I'm not a lutein and zeaxanthin hater. I just say, if you're going to do that, please respect that the eye needs a whole antioxidant network. Significance of carotenoids as the biomarker for cardiovascular disease for mortality and vascular aging. We know about it for macular degeneration, fruits and vegetable intake for cancer, low levels of carotenoids, increased risk of HPV infections, oxidative stress for rheumatoid arthritis, right? So we're using carotenoids as the biomarker. The key is just interpret the test the proper way. We as optometrists have interpreting this test that if you're low in carotenoids, then we must raise your carotenoids. I agree, but you gotta raise the rest of the antioxidant network. So here is oxidative stress. Remember I showed you this picture? And the cells that are dying, healthy cell, damaged cell, almost a dying cell, or almost a dead cell. We can see it here in the back of the eye. This is very bad oxidative stress, right through here. And I'm gonna go back one slide here. And when looking at an OCT, this hyperfluorescent line at the bottom, that is the RPE. Right above it, there's another hyperfluorescent line. That name has changed. It used to be the inner and outer segment of the photoreceptors, the photoreceptor integrity line. It has now been called the ellipsoid zone. And when I was trying to figure out why it hyperfluoresces, I found out that it's the mitochondria of the photoreceptors. You're literally looking at photoreceptor mitochondria. And when you look at them and you go across, and now you're looking at the mitochondria of the photoreceptor, and you see them being bright and then fading and bright and dying here dying they're still a little bit bright and dying you're looking at cell death oxidative stress right in front of your eyes it's just it's never been pointed out that way you're seeing the mitochondria fade from being bright white as in this picture over here maybe on this side and this patient's going to have good vision as opposed to this vision is going to start to drop because look at all the oxidative stress. We've been seeing it for years in the eyes, drusen, build up, oxidative stress. I like to point out that the photoreceptor, the, the, uh, of the RPE, the mitochondria are sitting right here. They sit at the base. Remember we talked about there's 700 mitochondria. They're mainly located right here at the base of the RPE. And what happens in macular degeneration is we get a buildup in Brooks' membrane of cholesterol. You can see the oxidative stress. The mitochondria, we can't really see failing like we do at the photoreceptor level. But notice where the macular degeneration is. Notice where the recipe of the mitochondria are located. And then we get more oxidative stress. Here's the picture. We see it happening. And then we finally get a drusen that forms. 
So should we be intervening a lot earlier in this disease? Here it is right here. The ellipsoid zone is considered before mainly by mitochondria. So this healthy ellipsoid zone right here are the mitochondria. Look how healthy those are whenever you look at a nice OCT scan. Those are healthy mitochondria, and that's why the patient sees well. And that's why you can predict the acuity by looking at that line on an OCT, because that's the, the powerhouse of the photoreceptor. Remember, the photoreceptor is basically from about this all the way down to the RPE. So this is all the photoreceptors, and then that's the mitochondria of the photoreceptor. Here was something that was pretty interesting. Someone published this on, the, on one of the uh, Facebook forums that I have, OCT Connect, and they were showing this, and I'm like, oh, look at the RPE. It's got a pink line to it. And there it says it's the mitochondria of the RPE. So there's the mitochondria, there's the RPE, then there's more mitochondria up in the photoreceptors. So when you get to the anti-aging conference, I'm like, wow, look at the connection. Mitochondria, OCT, can we help these patients out? Macular degeneration. So we want to intervene early in the disease. You can see when a drusen forms, it's very late in the disease. We should have probably been helping the patients with lifestyle changes, nutrition, sleep, early on in their, in their, in their life. Here's a paper by some really well-known optometrists in the United States. Paul Chouse is a patient that's in from the state of Washington. He is an optometrist who is a type 1 diabetic. He's probably the most knowledgeable person in diabetes because he's a patient himself. He's had vitrectomies and PRP. Stuart Richer was the founder of the Ocular Wellness and Nutrition Society. He passed away last October. Jeff Gerson is a well-known retina doc optometrist, and I don't know the fourth author. But if you go down through and just look at this was in their paper, they talk about diabetes, they talk about all the other conditions that can make it worse, but look what they have right here. Whoops, let's go back. Right here, they have oxidative stress. Two things can happen. The cells die or there's inflammation. When you have death and inflammation, you get diabetic retinopathy. And what I liked about what they were studying, look how more comprehensive their formula is. They, they studied a, a formula that was a little bit more expansive. Moving to where a lot of the functional doctors would go when I go to these anti-aging and saying, let's replace everything. Because when they score low, you want to do more of what we call an antioxidant replenishment therapy to help the patients. We can do it for diabetes, right? That was what they were studying here. The Diabetes Visual Function Supplement Study. Uh, the Diffuse Study. We can see diabetes with OCT angiography. There's no bleeding in this patient's eye. I want to intervene and help these patients out through nutrition before they end up with significant changes that we start to see here as if this is blood or exudate. So diabetes. Plenty of literature. Everyone wants evidence-based medicine or outcome-based medicine. There's lots of literature out there that supports nutrition. Antioxidants for glaucoma. Here is from the Airy slide deck. This is whenever I was helping them launch a new glaucoma medication called Ropressa, the Natarsidil. This is from their slide deck. I'm going to show you what I added. I changed nothing to their slide deck. You can see this is trabecular meshwork, how healthy it is. You can see the diseased. They called it, they called it cellular damage and oxidative stress. What I added was this. You're seeing it with this picture. You're seeing now the cell death right in front of your eyes. So can we help this patient out? by giving them nutrition. Am I saying we're gonna cure these people? No, but what I say to you, I wanna stack the deck in your favor, is what I'm trying to do. So, you know, here's a neuron in the back of the, or here's a neuron, you know, here's a neuron from glaucoma, or the axon, there's the ganglion cell, 
There's the nerve fiber layer. It goes through the optic nerve, through the lamina cribosa, becomes myelinated, and eventually makes it to the lateral geniculate body. In glaucoma, they have all these different reasons why that nerve dies. This was one of the reasons, mitochondrial dysfunction factors. So can we help these patients with helping them out? Here is a patient here, or here's, this is from LinkedIn. This was a person that says, what nutrition has to do with the brain? And it shows all the different supplements for homocysteine metabolism, B9, B12, blood flow, polyphenols, flavonoids, EPA, DHA, polyphenols, flavonoids, vitamin D. And this is just to keep a neuron in the brain healthy. And we always hear the eye is brain. The eye is brain. So we want to get it proper nutrition. So treatments for macular degeneration. We know smoking and lifestyle changes. I'm trying to change a lot of this, right? It says controversial flourishes for early macular degeneration. Why does it flourish? Why is it controversial? It's not controversial. The patient has disease. Try to take away some of their oxidative stress. We can measure macular pigments many ways. There are limitations, in my opinion, to the macular pigment. They're only found in the fovea. They're only found in the inner retina. They're there for a reason. We talked about it earlier. Clear disability to help us see better by reducing the blue light. And you can see here where they have shown where they're located. And in this picture, they would just be located here. Do we not care about the rest of the retina? We need to give it other, uh, other antioxidants. Here is Paul Bernstein showing through his work, the macular pigments. The macula is this big. It's five and a half millimeters. Here again is another representation, again, done by Paul Bernstein. His name's on here somewhere. And you can see where it's showing with the macular pigment and how it goes down to those cones in the fovea. But what about the rest of the retina? Here's what we should be doing more. See this patient here? I'm not having this happen to all of my patients, but look at the drusen, look at the RPE scar, and nine months later, after lifestyle changes, better sleep, and, oxid and using a good formula, the patient's drusen has reversed. And I've not only done that one time, I've done it several times, but I can also claim that I haven't done it on every patient because there's bio-individuality out there. So why aren't we using things like resveratrol and quercetin? Mitochondria, uh, right here, uh, resveratrol. Mitochondria environment and metabolic diseases. And it's a natural anti-VEGF. So this is why I like using the scanner in the practice. The scanner allows me to assess the patient's oxidative stress. So I screen everyone. That's my most recent score, or a recent score from before, not my most recent score. And the reason why we want to do this is because early, early detection that's out there. I showed you my thoughts on this a little bit earlier. So thank you for this opportunity, and I hope you found something useful with nutrition and the eye. Thank you very much.